This is our 12th session on Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. And what I would like to think about with you in this session is the relationship between God's choosing us and his predestining us. Are they the same? Are they different? Does one precede the other? Does one cause the other? So, Father, as we ponder this, these two amazing and uh, powerful and all shaping realities that happen before the foundation of the world, clarify for us the meaning of these in their relationship to each other, I ask, and how they apply to us now today. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And then those blessings. Even as he, he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. I argued that could, should go with what precedes, not what follows. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. So chosen in Jesus Christ, predestined through Jesus Christ. So what's the meaning of these two words? And we know just from our English, and it's the same in Greek, that choose would mean, uh, choose would be Select from a, a group. Well, let's just leave that out. Select a person or persons. Let's just say persons. Select persons from a group and uh, predestine would mean select a purpose, right? A purpose or a destiny from a, from a group of possibilities. So in choosing, God chooses persons, and in predestining, he chooses a purpose or purposes for those persons. Now, which comes first? Actually, in the Greek and in the English, the way this is translated, and I think it's, it's su suitable, you can't tell. This is an aorist participle in the Greek that could mean prior to this, or it could mean simultaneous with this. So choosing could lead into predestining, or predestining could lead into choosing. You can't tell by the tenses. But here's the key, and this is so interesting. The way Paul describes the choosing here, it is in and of itself a choosing of purpose, not just a choosing of persons, right? He chose us that we should be holy. So he chooses a destiny for us, chooses a person for a destiny. So right here you have predestination. So if God has already included predestination, that is a destiny of, of holiness and blamelessness before him for us, why didn't he just go on to say, just leave out this word, predestination, and say, he chose us in him that we should be holy and blameless and that we should be adopted. Or he could have said something like, he chose us in Christ for holiness and blamelessness and adoption. And the meaning would have been almost the same. But Paul did not do it that way. <laughs> so we don't, we don't tell him what to do. He tells us how to think. So the question is, why did he pause, pause, and start over, as it were, and say, he predestined us. 
having said he chose us with a destiny, that is, he predestined those whom he chose for holiness, he starts over and he makes it explicit with the word predestine. I am predestining this group here. I am predestining them for adoption to myself as sons through Christ. And my guess, my answer is for emphasis. Since he didn't have to add the word predestined, and adding it draws out the fact that it's implicit here. So what's implicit here for holiness becomes explicit here for adoption. Why might that be? And since emphasis is for big things, surely, <laughs> I say surely, adoption as sons is the most spectacular thing he could possibly predestine us for. I mean, it's wonderful that he destined us to be holy. Wonderful that he destined us to be blameless. But oh my, to tell us that for all eternity, I mean, let this sink in. We're talking about the creator of the universe is planning that his people be his children in his family forever. With all that that implies about inheritance and likeness and security and joy. Oh, my. So I, I'm not surprised that he would pull out this word and say, OK, I'm going to make this really emphatic here, even though predestination is implicit here to say I'm destining you for holiness and blamelessness. I'm going to pull it out and make it explicit in my choosing. I have a big, massive destiny in view, namely adoption. Let's go over here to the closest parallel and draw out another thing. In Romans 8, it says, We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. So God has a purpose and According to that purpose, he calls, and those whom he calls, he works everything together for their good. And now he breaks that down with a foundation. He argues for it and explains it. Because, or for, those whom he foreknew, and I've already argued, I think it was in session number uh, six on one, three through six. I argued this here was not foreknowledge of, uh, of faith that we produce on our own self-determining powers, but rather this is virtually synonymous with to recognize someone, acknowledge someone, choose someone. This is the same as the election or the choosing back in Ephesians 1, 4. So those whom he foreknew, he predestined. So they've got a link up again between election and predestination. I think just like in Ephesians 1, 4 and 5, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So here we have the same idea as predestined for adoption to himself here. And now over here, it's uh, predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So this is again saying the predestination is for sonship, because if we are brothers of the Son, then we are sons of the Father. We don't become God, but oh my goodness, the status of being brothers of the eternal Son of God in the family of God is staggering. And here's another link with chapter 1 of Ephesians conformed to the image of his son is virtually the same as holiness, isn't it? So over here, we are chosen to be holy and blameless and then predestined for adoption. And over here, we are predestined to have the likeness of the son of God. And that likeness is his holiness. Go back here to 
chapter 1, and notice one or two other things. This predestination for adoption happens through Jesus Christ. We become children, sons of, of God through Jesus Christ, which means Christ is both the, the model, which we saw in 829, and he's the means or the, the, uh, the basis. In other words, this, this through here implies we could never have been adopted had Christ not died for us and shed his blood and cleansed us for our sin and made us holy and blameless so that we belong in the family of God. So this preeminence here of our elder brother, firstborn among many brothers, that preeminence is implied in through Jesus Christ. We don't get ourselves in and then say, well, here we are, Jesus, we're your brothers. No, the, the Son came and died for us and sought us and chose us and made us conform to himself. And maybe the way to end would be to say, what we've seen now in this is that God achieves his ultimate goal, let's put it like this, by God achieves his ultimate goal of choosing and predestining. God achieves his ultimate goal by purposeful election, or we could just use the simpler word, choosing. God accomplishes his ultimate goal in the universe, in creation and redemption, by purposeful election. And getting that from chose so that we be holy. That's the purpose, that's the election. By purposeful election of holy sons in the likeness of Jesus. And remember, Jesus said, as I have loved you, you should love one another. It's in love that we are chosen to be holy and blameless. When I say he chose holy sons, I don't mean we were already sons. I mean he chose us to make us sons. So the purpose of the election is adoption, an adoption unto conformity to Christ, which is holiness and blamelessness in love or likeness to our great elder brother. It would be good to just turn this off and pray and worship and ask the Lord to give you a heart that can grasp these immeasurable, unspeakable things.